Testing one, two, well, good morning, everybody. It is a wonderful morning. We're going to start off with a, a song called Not By Power. But I wanted to remind everybody again on that stuff out there in the sanctuary. If you want some of that stuff, you can have some. And uh, there's a donation thing if you want to donate anything, but it is ready to go. And we are going to try to deal with that stuff today and tomorrow. So if you're going to get some, do it now. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Not By Power. It goes like this.
by my but my spirit says the Lord praise the Lord yes. sounds so good Lord we thank you so much for this opportunity to share and to serve we just thank you again and ask for these things in Jesus name we pray amen here's one called famous one amen.
Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Praise the Lord. We're going to be talking about that today. We're going to be in Revelation, and we're going to be, be exploring that and looking at that. Um, can we have our usher come forward today? Um, um, <laughs> thank you, Tom. We're going to do one called In Christ Alone. It goes like this.
Christ alone. Well, right now it is time for uh, the greeting. Yes. Greeting. Greetings right now. Greetings and then we'll have our film. Let's greet one another right now. to the devil, like the devil. Yeah, absolutely. One day, the devil came to tempt Jesus. He wanted to trick Jesus into sinning. Are you kidding me? The devil think he was just gonna outsmart Jesus? He just wanted to trick Jesus? Yeah, it's in the Bible. Jesus lived a perfect life, but he was human, just like you and me. So he was tempted to do things. Huh, weird. All right, well, tell me the story then. Jesus was in the wilderness, what was he doing there? Like camping, napping, snacking, making s'mores by the fire, Jesus style? No, no s'mores. Jesus was in the wilderness to be alone with God. He was there for 40 days praying and fasting. Fasting? What's that? Like running super fast? Watch this. I bet Jesus was the fastest kid in his class. What? No, I mean, I don't know. He was just a regular guy who also happened to be God. When the Bible says he was fasting, it means that he didn't eat any food for those 40 days. No oh, food for 40 days? That's like over a month. I can't even go like 40 minutes without food. Why would he do that? 
Jesus was taking that time, the time you usually use to eat, to get closer to God and pray. So, now we know what Jesus was tempted to do. Tempted to eat some dinner. After 40 days, the devil showed up in the wilderness and started talking to Jesus. That's freaky. It's okay. Jesus wasn't scared of it. The devil knew Jesus hadn't eaten any food for a long time, so he said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Ooh, man, love bread. Did Jesus do that? He sure did. And he was really hungry. I bet bread sounded so good to him. But it was more important to him what the Bible says. So he told the devil no and used God's word to do it. He said, the Bible says people should not live on bread alone, but by every word that God says. Well, obviously you can't live on just bread, Hannah. You need pizza, cheeseburgers, mac and cheese, cake, ice cream, and a fruit. Yes, a fruit is good. But that's not what he meant. He meant we can't survive with just food. We need the Word of God, the Bible, to keep our spirits fed. Ah, that makes sense. Well, good job, Jesus. You really showed him. The devil wasn't done. He had another way to tempt Jesus. Oh, no. The devil took Jesus up to a really high place in the city and said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, jump off this building because the Bible says God will tell his angels to protect you. They'll catch you with their hands so your foot won't even hit the ground. Hold on, why does he keep saying, if you're the Son of God? It's Jesus, obviously he's the Son of God. Yes, but the devil is challenging him. It's kind of like he's saying, well, prove it. But well, why doesn't Jesus just show him who's boss and proves it? If the Bible says angels will catch him, just jump off the roof and let him catch him. You know, if someone were to challenge me to do something I knew I could do, you bet I would do it. Well, Jesus might have wanted to prove it, but the devil was trying to trick him into doing something he wasn't supposed to do. But the devil said something that's in the Bible. Like I said, he was trying to trick Jesus. So Jesus said no and told him, the Bible says do not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil was trying to trick Jesus into testing God. Yes, there are angels to protect us, but we aren't supposed to do something dangerous just to see if God is telling the truth. Uh, yeah, well, when you say it like that, it doesn't really seem like a good idea anymore. Nope. All right, Jesus, two for two. And the devil had one more temptation up his sleeve. What now? The devil took Jesus up to a tall mountain so he could see all the kingdoms of the world. It must have been like a really tall mountain. Then the devil said, I will give all of this to you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Ugh, gross. That sounds like a terrible idea. How would that even tempt Jesus? Well, Jesus knew that the world did belong to the devil because Adam and Eve sinned. And there was a plan for Jesus to get it back, but it meant dying on the cross. So the devil was telling him, if you do this, it would be all yours without you having to die. It's like, what would you do for a million dollars? But instead, what would you do so you don't have to die on the cross? Oh man, that one's kind of a toughie. Well, what did Jesus do? Then Jesus said, the Bible says, worship God only and only serve him. So the devil left. He couldn't get Jesus to sin. Of course he couldn't. My boy Jesus can't put nothing on him. Okay, that's enough of that. The end. Well, that was kind of an interesting one for Revelation. We are in Revelation today. And if you would turn there with me to Revelation 17. <clears throat> I heard of a story about a man that was feeling very ill, and he didn't know what the problem was. So I went to see his doctor, and he got a complete checkup, and a bunch of different tests were run. A few days later, the doctor called the man and his wife back, and the doctor said to the man, Sir, would you wait outside? I have a talk with your wife on the office on the inside. The doctor said, Ma'am, would you sit down? I'd like to tell you a little bit about your husband's problem. He has a rare disease that's compounded by stress. I'm telling you, your husband could die unless radical measures are taken. And here's what you need to do. You have to create it for him a stress-free environment. By that I mean up every morning and make him a favorite meal for breakfast. Don't ever bother him about bills, any more troubles, or any concerns. For lunch, it should be a gourmet meal made from scratch and whatever he wants. The same for dinner. Now listen, you want to smother him with affection and tell him you love him constantly. Do this day in and day out, and if you follow this regiment for nine months to a year, your husband will make a full recovery. She said, thank you very much, doctor. And she left the office and she got in the car. And they were driving home and the husband said to the wife, well, tell me, honey, what did the doctor say? And she said, you're going to die. <laughs> You're gonna die. But my wife would do that for me, I know. 
Let's go to God in prayer here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can come together and pray. And I thank you for just giving us a good day. Just pray that the Spirit is here and just fill us up, Lord, and just help it be a wonderful, wonderful day. Just fill us up with all the wisdom that we need and stuff. We want to hold up certain ones today. They want to hold up Connie, who's not feeling that well, and something wrong with her liver or something. Lord, I pray that you would heal her and just help her to feel better immediately, Lord. Help her that way. And we want to pray for Vern, too, who's dealing with cancer treatments. We pray that you would just bless him and keep him happy and healthy. And we just, we just pray that you would just be in this church, Lord, and just help it grow and just help it to be something special. We, we are so thankful to, to, be able to, to be able to be part of this. We just pray for a, just a special healing in it. And I just pray that you would just bless us in a big way. And we just turn it over to you now, and we thank you again for everything you're doing in our lives and in our heart and in our life. We ask for these things in your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I never did mention the uh, Saturday movie that we're going to be dealing with um, that Saturday after the 4th. We have, it's on child trafficking. It's called the Son of Freedom, and we have the 20 tech. Do you, do you want it? Yes. Okay, <laughs> you, you weren't here when we were having no, that. The tickets. For, for the, oh, yes, yes. We bought 20 tickets for it, so we're going to go on Saturday, not this, the Saturday after the 4th. We're going to meet there and there at 3 o'clock. And so, well, we can take you. We're, we're taking people to it. You have to work on Saturday? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I really wanted to see that. I was aware that I knew it was coming. It's, it's going to be a good one, yeah. I'll check and see. Maybe I can get it off. Maybe you can so. figure something out. We'll, we'll be here, though, anyway. I have three left. Three left. Okay. okay. Okay, well today we are talking about beauty and the beast. There was a pastor who had a granddaughter who was, got married at his church and it was a beautiful wedding. Uh, the pastor happened to have a Model A Ford. And the pastor thought it would be one of the greatest automobiles that ever was built. And he thought it would be a great idea if they gave them a ride with the rag top in the back. The pastor was 1929 Model Ford, black and yellow rag top. It was a pretty little thing, but he didn't drive it that much. He kept it for drive it just once in a while, would put his hands on it, touch it, and just things like that. But the grandpa's the pastor's granddaughter said, oh, Papa, why don't you take us in that car and down from the church in the rumble seat of the Model A Ford? The pastor said he'd be glad to do it. And so he took them after the wedding to the rumble seat and the seat in the back of the, and it opens up, up in the back and they sat there and he drove them over to their car for the escape and their honeymoon and it was really a wonderful thing. It was a wonderful thing and they had put on the back of the Model A Ford uh, a sign that said, just married. Well, tin cans were tied to it, and there were balloons festering the car, and they got in there, and they drove them to their car, and then they got in their car, and they went home. And then this other pastor, this pastor had another granddaughter, and she was in her 20s, and he said to her, you ride with me when I take the car back. And it didn't dawn on him what was happening there. But there they were going down the highway, and the sign on the back, just married with balloons that were there, with tin cans behind them. And here's the grandfather with their granddaughter. And the pastor said that 18 wheelers were driving by and they woo and point at him with that. And they knew what he was thinking that this old geezer was down with some young 20-year-old girl. Thinking about how earth and how earth did he talk to her into marrying him. But that's a classic example of what we we're talking about for Beauty and the Beast. But the difference is between that episode and this episode that we're talking about Beauty and the Beast. Is that Patter's pastor's granddaughter was with him, was probably beautiful without and within. But the beauty that we're going to be talking about is beauty on the outside, but ugly within. Now, the beauty is skin deep, but ugly goes all the way to the bone. But beauty is only beautiful outside. So we're going to find out about this beauty in the beast. And it all deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is at the end of the age. The man has always wanted to know the future and look into the future, but so many times he makes awful mistakes. And so many times he makes awful mistakes, and maybe like this weatherman. I heard of a weatherman, I had to leave the city and go to another one because the weather didn't agree with him. 
<laughs> so often that's true. But people make prognostications about all things that so often they fail. And Bible is the only book that is bad, bad, batting an average of a thousand. No Christian should be ignorant of prophecy, especially in these days that we live. Because I believe that the shadows of the end of the age is light lightning. Remember, there's no shadow when Christ was here. It was high noon. Now, I believe that the sands of time is running low, and we're standing in the threshold of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church, and the things that are prophesied are imminent, and I believe that Jesus Christ could come before I finish this message. There was a beast, an antichrist, and he's lurking in the shadows somewhere, getting ready to take over. Now, we need to know because of the intercession factor, and we need to pray because, like we've never prayed before, and secondly, we need to know because of the soul winning factor, because we need to get our loved ones and our brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and children, whoever it may be, into the ark of safety. And we need to know from family instruction matter that we need to prepare our loved ones for things that are coming. So I say we cannot afford to be ignorant. Thirdly, we need to know for a comfort factor because you may think that things are coming apart, but I want to tell you that everything is fitting into the sockets of prophecy. So we need to understand this. Today I'm going to be looking in the 17th chapter and discover mystery woman that I call beauty. And then we're going to discover the beast or the antichrist, the man of sin. The period of time that we're talking about here is the Great Tribulation, so in Bible Tribulation, what we're studying is this. Now the rapture has already taken place. The church has blood, 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 blood bought body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the bride of Christ, has been taken out and is the true bride. Now the false bride and the false church, the heart that shows him herself. The first thing I want you to see is, number one, the woman and her mysterious character on your outline. Verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee that judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Well, what does this mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what it means right now. The woman is apostate, represents an apostate, a false worldwide, on your outline, religion. It's a false worldwide religion. Now, because the woman in the Bible prophesies is always a symbol of religion. And the church is what the Lord Jesus has called, what, the bride of Christ. But this is not religion, this is relationship. God is making one new man. And we'll see that later. Here is a false religion, is antithesis of what I'm talking about, describing as a woman. This is a false church, the harlot, the whore, on your outline, the Antichrist, if you will, because the Antichrist is going to have an anti-church, loyalty to Jesus called spiritual purity. Let's look at the scripture. Look at James warned the church with James 4.4. He says this, he says, um, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy to God. Well, that means if we fur with prostitute world, this heart of the world, we become an enemy of our Lord and Savior God. He's the bridegroom. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2. It says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The church is the virgin that's going to be presented to the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. Now notice verse 2. Now this woman is one who seduced the nations. And here it is in the verse 2. It says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornications. So the woman stands for false religions. Now what does the Babylon stand for? The Babylon stands for false religions also. Now the word Babylon is a code word. We use code words today like Wall Street. We talk about Wall Street and they're talking about a literal street. No, we're talking about what they're talking about more than that. They're talking about the economic system when we say Wall Street. We talk about Madison Avenue. We're talking about um, Avenue named Madison. No, we're talking about a system of merchandising on Madison Avenue. 
And now when he uses the term Babylon here, he's talking about it more than the Babylon, the city, the true Babylon. However, it is rooted in that, that it's just Wall Street. It's just rooted in true street. And you can walk down Wall Street right there in, in, uh, in New York, and it is a true avenue, just like Babylon is a literal place in Iraq. But the Bible uses the term Babylon here, uses the term in a larger sense. Babylon goes back in history. Babylon is great in antiquity. Babylon is great in antiquity. And Babylon is great in prophecy. Babylon is, in your outline, the cradle and the grave of all false religions. If you go back to chapter 10 and 11, you would find that the Babylon was built, first of all, by a man named Nimrod in your Bible. Nimrod. The very name Nimrod means rebel. Nimrod is a symbol or a type or a prophecy of an antichrist to come. He was an enslaver of men. He was a hunter of men. He built a tower, a tower of Babel, whose top was unto heaven. He wasn't trying to build heaven in the stratosphere. That's not what it means. It means at the top of the tower he placed a pagan worship. And that's what it means there. And it means unto, it was unto heaven and it was there that man first began pagan idolatrous worship on your outline. All false religion roots back to Babylon so long ago. Look what it says in Daniel, Daniel 5, 7, it says this. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Let her shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and be shown to be the third ruler of the kingdom. Daniel was in Babylon and the king had a dream that needed to be interpreted. Notice what it was saying, bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. Do you see how false religion is rooted there as far back as in Daniel's time? They had the magicians, they had their soothsayers, they had their astrologers, and Babylon has been all throughout history a den of demons. The world today is haunted by the ghosts of Babylon. The Bible speaks of her wine of fornication. Now what that wine was bottled centuries and centuries ago, but men are still getting drunk on that wine today. Look at astrology. Did you know in the world today, one billion people practice astrology? Many of them are A-American. By the way, if you have a horoscope in your home, get rid of it now. Don't fool with it. I'm telling you, don't tantalizing with it. And that, I tell you, that would be like a married man flirting with somebody that's not on his. And get it out now. You see, Satan is not a man of religion, not at all. He's not against religion. I mean, as a matter of fact, Satan is working to worldwide religion on your outline. He's working with worldwide religion. The first temptation of the Garden of Eden, Satan was not against religion, it was for religion. The devil was trying to tell Eve how she could be godly. And he said, if you do this, you will be like a god. It wasn't temptation to fall down. It was a temptation to climb up and to do it godly, the devil's way. The world is going to see the worldwide religion during this great tribulation. The world is going to be unified by the beast with false religions. And this false religion will have all the resources that it will ever have. Look what it says in verse 4 of, of Revelation. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness with her fornication. First thing I want you to see is the woman and her mysterious character. When the Bible links her with Babylon, the mystery is unlocked, and we see that she is a woman deeply involved in apostate false religion. And it's because we are going to see a worldwide religion. Secondly, I want you to see the woman and her mischievous children. Look at verse 5. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. You see, this woman who had her origin, origin in Babylon so long ago has spawned many children across the world. This heart of the woman has given birth to all false religions in the world. All false religions. She's taught their daughters how to prostitute themselves. She's a mother of a harlot. 
And why are some of these harlots? New Age religion, faith in worship, Mother Earth worship, Islam, uh, uh, Buddhism, globalism, humanism, apostate Christianity, all false religions. All of these are daughters of this false religion. And we live in a world today that's being engulfed by something else, the New Age movement. The eye over the pyramid and the dollar is the New Age movement. It includes holistic health professionals and college ecologists and political activists and educators and human potential advocates, goddess worshipers, reincarnists and astrologers and much, much more. It is a syncretism of all world's religion. All world religions do go together when you think about it, just Christianity doesn't. One of the leaders in the New Age movement said this, now listen, we are the truth and beauty of all world religions, leaving that each have a seed of God, a kernel of spirit that unites us. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Now here is what New Agers said, said. New Agers feel that God revealed himself in Jesus, he revealed himself in Buddha, he revealed himself in Christina and hosts of others, and therefore they don't believe that the Bible alone is our only guide. Now they have something else called monism. And that's a word that we don't use very much, but monism is a theory that all reality is a unified whole. The word itself comes from the Greek word mona, meaning everything is together. So any apparent differences or any perceived differences that aren't apparent aren't really real. And you take monism and connect it with something called panism, and meaning pan and all, theism meaning God, meaning everything is God. In the New Age's religion, there's no such thing as creator and the creation. It's everything. It's all together. It's all the ecology, all of this earth worship. Mother Earth, rather than Father God, is part of the last world movement. And the people of the world now are trying to unify the religions of the world. There's just going to come one world religion. And there's coming a one world time. And a matter of fact, there's a move that's how we have the United Nations, a move to united religion. We have that right now. Our organization is already in place. A charter is formed. Here's the Declaration of Global Ethic, and it states this. Listen to it. We affirm that there is a revocable, unconditional norm for all areas of life, for families, communities, for races and nations and religion. There are already exist ancient guidelines for human behavior. That's right. All the way back to the Tower of Babel. Ancient guidelines for human behavior which are found in the teachings and the religions of the world in which the conditions for a sustainable world <laughs> order. Friends, there's coming, I'm sure as I'm standing here, there's coming a worldwide religion. So you see the worldwide religion, we see mysterious character because she stands for false religion. Do you see this woman with her mischievous children? She has found many different, many daughters, and all of them are prostitutes. There's a third one, third thing I want you to see. I want you to see this woman and her murderous conduct. Her murderous conduct. Look at what it says in Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now this woman, this hideous woman, beautiful on the outside, yet ugly to the bone, she is not a prostitute. She is, on your outline, murderous. False religion has always been a bloody thing. And why do I say Christianity is not truly a religion? It's a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. But this woman is drunk with the blood of the saints, and during the tribulation there will be coerced conversions, where you will believe, or you will bow your knee to the beast, or you will die. Chapter 13, it's speaking about the censure minister of propaganda, the false prophet. Look what it says in 13, 15, it says, and the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. While well, he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that both speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. You see, it becomes a forced conversion. I don't believe in forced conversions. As a matter of fact, that's a contradiction in terms. Change a person against his will is of the same opinion still. The biggest mistake that has blackened the pages of Christianity were the so-called crusades. 
We were weeping the bitter fruit of the Crusades when trying to enforce Christianity to conquer the Holy Lands with a sword. And also the Antichrist will be into forced conversions also. Now I want to write to, to try to persuade anybody to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And with all my heart and all my soul, I don't want to believe in any forced, forced conversions. But the soil of planet Earth is drenched with blood. The woman is drunk with the blood of martyrs. And I'm telling you, more people have died for the cause of Christ in this one last century than all the centuries since the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see women and her murderous activities. And here's the next thing I want you to see. I want you to see number four, the woman and her monstrous concord. Consort. Consort. And she has a consort. She has a friend. And it was called the Bride of the Beast. The bride of the beast. I'm not sure if they ever got married because they keep coming together, but she is a prostitute. Look at Revelation 17, 3. It says this. So I carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Well, he does sound kind of beastly. He's ugly himself. He's seven heads and ten horns. I'd hate to meet him. Look at it reads in 7 and 8. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that that saw was, is, was, is, is not. The beast that thou saw was and is not. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is to come. Well, that sounds kind of funny there. Look at this for a very moment. I'll try to clear it up. The beast is the Antichrist in this kingdom. And that's what the beast represents, just as the woman in Babylon represents false religions. I want you to see the ultimate, ultimate alliance of church and state. Now, I don't believe that the alliance of church and state, if you mean a church run government, a government funded church, I don't believe in that. I do believe in the right for every freeborn American to express himself in matters of politics or religion or whatever it is, because I believe in that. But I don't believe in the separation of God from government. But then let's look at this beast, and if we pick apart for a moment, let's look at the place from which this beast comes. Now the beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And what that means is he's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit, and that means that he has died and he is incarcerated, and he is coming up, going out from the bottomless pit. How's he going to do that? Well, the beast and the Antichrist are going to capitulate the power with a satanic miracle. And the devil who always wanted to imitate and take the place of Almighty God is going to give this false Christ, his Antichrist, a resurrection or some kind of resuscitation, which is the appearance of a resurrection, and it's hard to tell. But let's look at it. Look what it says in Revelation 13, 3. It says this, And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. The Bible speaks of the beast, and it says that one of his heads, as it was wounded unto death, and one of those heads could be one of his kings, and I believe it is the Antichrist, because Christ's resurrection will be imitated. Now it says his deadly wound was healed, his head is going to die, and appear to die, and it says wounded unto death. And then out of the abyss he comes. And he says he's going to cause all the world to wonder, and I believe it's going to be an imitation of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going to be the beast stamp of approval on it. In Russia, there is a circumference of Lenin, and his body is lying there in crystal, crystal circumferences, circumferences. And they think about what they would have happened to if after all they put Lenin in the sarcophagus and kept him there for at least three and a half years, and he were to come out alive. I tell you one thing it would make a deal with, and it would, all the world would wonder and say, everybody would say, communism is definitely the way to go. But what I'm trying to say is that this person comes out of the abyss because it's a place where he comes, and what's the purpose for which he will come? It is to deceive us. 
It says in Mark, verse 8, they will dwell on the earth, shall wonder whose the names were not written in the book of life. And you say, will I go into the great tribulation? I won't be deceived. Oh, yes, you will. If you're here today and you hear the truth, you don't receive it. You listen what's going to happen. You look what it says in Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. It says, and with all the seemableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That is heavy. It makes me think of the politicians that go with Trump. And all of a sudden, you know, they get held to the fire. They believe a lie, and Christ says that lie. And when you hate the truth, you will embrace the lie. Notice the power that comes, it says in verse 9 of that chapter, even him who is coming is after the working of Satan, and all power and signs and lying wonders. That is big. Look at verse 17, chapter, verse 9. And there is a mind which hath wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Well, what city is built on seven hills? It's Rome, on your ally, Rome. And this power is going to be concentrated in Rome. In 1957, the very important treaty was written by half a dozen European countries, which was pronounced it was the Treaty for Rome. And out of this Treaty of Rome is what we call today the European Comet Market, which is reunification of Europe. The Roman Empire we established and it will be in the last days. The beast is coming to concentrate his power and is consorting with the religion of Rome. And that is that power is going to come from. He's going to rule over the empire. The United States of Europe or something about all those states together. Notice the period in which he comes in 10 and 11. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue short space. And one well, of the beast that was and is not, even he is, the eight, and his of the seven that goeth into perdition. So these seven kings, the five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. Let's just pause there for a minute. John is seeing a prophecy of seven world leaders, or seven emperors, seven kings, and five are fallen. Now, there have been many there in John's day. We have five emperors, and there's one that's alive, and, 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 and the died, that lived. And there's a Roman emperor on the throne when G John wrote the epistle, and he said that this other is yet to come. So we're talking about the Roman one that's then, and then the one that's yet to come. And it means there is coming a final Caesar. There's coming a last ruler of the world empire of Rome. So the seven becomes the eight. So the five has gone into the grave. One was experiencing. When John was writing, there was one and yet to come. Then he says, when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now in verse 11, the beast that was and is not, he is the eight. What does that mean? One that went into the grave was the seventh, and the one that comes out is the eighth. And he is the one that goes into the grave of a human, and he comes out a superhuman. This is the Antichrist. This is what he's talking about. This is at the very end of the very end of his sequence. And think about the people that he comes with. Let me read 12 and 13 here. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So ten horns, which thou sawest as ten kings. The horn in Bible prophecy is an animal, speaks of power. And it's obvious that ten horns of this beast speak of ten kings. And we have received no kingdom as of yet. But they receive power as kings for one hour with the beast. One hour in Greek is, means a season. One hour is a season. It also means a period of time. So it doesn't necessarily mean like an hour like that. But these puppet kings out of the United Roman Empire, in verse 13, said they have one mind, and they will give their power and their strength to the beast. Now what you have is the United States of Europe, federation of ten nations. Ten can bring the complete number. The Catholic Church has already designated the ten nations into the ten sections. We've seen the United States and Canada and Mexico as just one nation. Seems like the rapture must be gone. They're going to make this one nation. 
You will have one world government, the Western world will have one mind, and that is to yield to the beast who acknowledges the law of lordship. The beast himself is the genius of this federation. He will be unifying factor for the United States of Europe, the one who died and was that and then is again. The one who died and was not and then is again. Now notice the passion that he comes in in verse 14. He says this, they, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. And he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called the chosen and faithful. These may shall make war with the Lamb, but the Lamb shall overcome them. Now, do you think that the battle of Armageddon and all the nations of the world, when they come against Armageddon, that they're primarily coming against Israel? No. No, they're primarily against Israel, but against the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, the devil in his insanity will still think that he can overthrow the Lord. And that's the reason that I call the study the triumph of the Lamb. Because the Lamb is the Lion. Now the beast, he comes to make war with the Lamb, and he has one passion, that has defied the Lamb. The beast will strut on the stage of history and he'll meet with his demise there at Armageddon and all those who follow the beloved beast will discover that they made a poor choice, a poor decision. Let's move on to the fifth and final point of this chapter. You say, well, Pastor, you don't explain it well enough. I'm trying to get through chapters in a few minutes. But let's look at number four, number five, at the woman, her momentous calamity. What's going to happen to the apostate religion? This is going to happen to the scarlet woman, this beauty who is really ugly. But speaking of the beast and his armies, let me read it, 16 through 18. And then 10 horns, um, 15 through 18, 15 through 18 too. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And then the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, into the king's hearts to fulfill their will, to hate her, and to agree to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, Babylon, which ripened, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. What's going to happen is this, the Babylon monster is going to turn around and destroy, on your outline, the Babylonian mother. Years ago, kids used to sing a little song, when she sailed away on a happy summer day on the back of a crocodile. Mr. Croc winked his eye and she waved upon goodbye on her face. There was a smile, but at the end of the ride, the lady was inside and a smile on the crocodile. <laughs> and what does that mean exactly? It means, dear friend, that the woman ought not to ride the beast because he's going to turn on her. He's going to devour her because he is going to detest her. First of all, he's going to hate her because the honeymoon is over. And just like any marriage of convenience, then he's going to desolate her. And then he's going to see all the riches that she has, and he's going to want them all for himself. And then he's going to disgrace her, and he's going to make her naked. He's going to expose all of her moral vileness, and the scandals will be exposed of all the religions and all the scandals and everything. And then he is going to devour her, and he's going to eat her flesh, and then he's going to destroy her, and he's going to burn her with fire. Now, that's the reason that we're going to see in the next chapter that God speaks about Babylon. Next week, we're going to be talking about Babylon. God says, come out of her, my people. Why is the Antichrist going to do this? For several reasons. One, he wants to be the ruler of the world, and he doesn't want any competition, not even with, on your outline, religion. He is going to destroy her for providential reasons. Notice how religion is the most powerful thing on earth. It's so powerful. If we don't use it, we don't use it, don't, don't, don't use it, it doesn't really help us, but it can be so powerful, our faith. The Bible says God will put it in their minds, and did you know the devil is really God's servant? The Bible doesn't rule, God rules, because the devil is on a leash. And then he's going to destroy her for political reasons. He wants to rule the world. And I wish I had more time to explain, but friend, that's the story of Beauty and the Beast. Listen, there's coming, it's coming like gangbusters, a world religion and a world government. 
If you don't believe in this world or this government, you belong to Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. You don't belong to a harlot church. You belong to the bride of Christ. In these days right now, we're not in the great tribulation. The coming events cast a shadow ahead of time. I want to tell you that you've got to be loyal to the heavenly bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the bride of Christ. So don't flirt with false religions. Oh, Pastor, I need to know about all these other religions, so I'm going to study all the religions of the world. Do you know what you remind me of when you say something like that? You remind me of a married man that wants to see what all the other women of the world are like. Listen, you are true to Jesus. You don't have to study all the other religions. You just know the Lord Jesus. And all of you married men never flirt with another woman. Never cease to flirt with your wife. You be true to Jesus Christ and you get a bulldog grip on the truth. Because coming to see you that you're there is going to come great pressure. And you're going to see Jesus Christ as Lord. So you've got to say it and you've got to mean it. And that is the story of beauty and the beast. Let's pray. If you're not saved, the best advice to you to give your heart to Jesus, and not today, but right now, I want you to pray. In this prayer, you're going to ask Jesus to come into your heart. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved, Lord. So help me and trust me. Trust, I trust you today, Lord, to help me on my ways. Help me strengthen my ways and fill, fill my life with boldness and help me be a good example for you, Lord. Help me do something that would, that would just reassure myself that I'm trying to do what I want to do. And Lord, I pray that you just bless everybody here in a big way with boldness and to what they would share with others and tell them others about the truth of you. So we thank you again, Lord. We take communion today and we pray that we would examine ourselves and, and look at our ways and see the falseness in our ways and just help us, Lord. Help us with finding out what we need for ourselves. We need you, Lord, and we thank you again for everything. And we come to you and we ask for all of these things. In your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have a communion song. We're going to do communion right now. And uh, Tom, would you go ahead and help us with this? We're going to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Oh, 
church and all the people that go to it, I pray that you bless them really good and just let them go home feeling happy and full of joy and just full of grace, Lord. We thank you again for everybody that's here and we ask for all of these things in your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name and the church said, Amen. 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 Go with God today and have a great day. Don't forget about the garage sale stuff. Don't